East. Love it. But I do like it. Are you guys ready to roll? Yeah, let's do it. All right. <clears throat> Good evening, everybody. It is Tuesday night, and therefore, it is Tuesday Night Live with Power Destiny. Rick and Brett here, along with a supremely uh, honored guest, uh, someone that we've known and loved and shared with and shared seminars with and shared stages with and learned from over many, many years, the author of Synchronicity, Dr. Ken Harris. Ken, first of all, we haven't seen you in a while. We speak, but you're looking fantastic. It's great to see you, buddy. Well, it's great to be here, and I feel honored and privileged that I'm going to have this opportunity to address your, your tribe. So, Ken, you know, what a lot of people don't know about you, you know, the people that do know you, know you. A lot of people may not know you, especially our tribe members, and you're going to be speaking for our group in, in a less than a month from now, so it's going to be awesome. One of the things we look up to you about is you are a practicing chiropractor for, you said, 45 years, a very holistic approach, and you're a very spiritual man. And now you come with this book, you've written a book called Synchronicity. And so that's kind of the topic for tonight. And it's also the topic of what you're going to be speaking about to our group. Can you just kind of start off with how you got to this point? How you, what's inspired you to write this book um, without giving too much away, obviously. I, I've, I've both Rick and I just received a personal signed copy from you. So thank you. Thank you. But how did you get to writing this book? What does synchronicity mean, right? And what can people learn from it? Well, I, um, I was told to write the book, uh, to be very honest with you, I kept having these meaningful coincidences. That's in, in, the, in the briefest terms, that's what a synchronicity is. When right. two things happen, they intersect in time and space, and you start connecting the dots of, of the relationship between uh, event A and event B. So I kept having sequential synchronicities, one after another. And I resisted writing the book initially because I said, so I met all these famous people. I wound up working for Chopra. I took care of Wayne Dyer, blah, 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 blah. Who cares? That's my story. And then I heard the voice say, hey, dummy, it ain't about you. Write the book to remind people they're having them themselves and they're not walking alone here on this planet. There is guidance being offered to you and them continuously, but you need to stay aware, awake, and alert. So the reason I wrote the book was to remind people of their own and give them a roadmap. Uh, in the book, the, the, it's two sections, there's stories, but the second half of the book gives them the seven, six, five, four principles of synchronicity, how they can manifest more of them in their life because they can be done deliberately. And why is that so important, do you think? Well, I think people need to know that uh, they're, in con they're in control of their destiny. Then we're not flotsam and jetsam just being pushed from pillow to post. They can actively participate in manifesting anything they want in their life if they know how to apply the laws. It's a law. Synchronicity is a law. And it's ubiquitous, by the way. It's happening to people all the time, everywhere, but they're not aware of it. So the book gives them that. And so they, they think it's like things are just happening for no apparent reason, total chaos to the universe. And what you're saying, what we all believe, and I know, and I don't want to speak for Rick, but that the world is organized, everything happens for a reason. Things happen to us, I believe, to kind of help us get to the next stage in our life and so forth, especially when you look back on your life. But before Rick jumps in, um, there was one thing that came up. Um, the author, and I thought this was interesting, I was having a conversation with my wife about the book, because she goes, well, what's that? And I showed her the book and she goes, well, let me read it. And she's a voracious reader and she read the whole thing over the weekend, of course. It's an easy and read. Right, exactly. So we started having a conversation and she brought up to me that there was an article by Malcolm Gladwell where he talks about how the choices that we make lead to certain events in our life. Like if you had left one minute later, then such and such event wouldn't have happened. Or if you did leave and this would have happened. And so the choices that we make could lead to these different things. And you could go back farther and farther and farther or further and further. And it's like, you know, it's weird, but you, you know what I'm trying to say? Exactly. It's like Hansel right. and Gretel, you, you, you know, they, they found their way home by connecting, by picking up the breadcrumbs. They connect right. the dots. Right. The, the, you said something very significant. We're not, life is intelligent. Life can be trusted. It's not haphazard. When you, I said, the last thing I say in my book, w when you come to the end of your life and you reflect back, you're going to come to realize one thing. It was never random. 
things happen in sequence for a very specific reason. So we're not mathematical or probability and statistics. No way, Jose. Some of the things that happened to me and happened to some of the people listening could never have been predicted mathematically. People who, who are skeptics around synchronicity say, well, that's just chance. If you do it enough time, that's going to happen. No way, Jose. You can live hey, you're years. saying you can deliberately oh. manifest synchronicities. You can. By, by, I, I would. I would think that's that your mind and listening to the to the wee voice inside your hunch, your your intuitions, whatever it is, listening and following those types of things. I know this for some people. This might sound a little airy fairy. However, as we evolve as a species, I think more and more people are getting into meditation, quieting the mind. Or I think it's becoming more acceptable now and even the scientific community as well. And I think that as you kind of quiet the mind, I think those thought flashes that BJ talked about and other people before him, of course, these things come into play. And if by listening to your intuition, you're saying that you have a formula in the book that you can begin to develop and create these synchronicities that can have a pretty pretty cool outcome. I would right, think, right? Neuros neuroscience supports the, the uh, belief or the understanding that you can deliberately create synchronicity through through um, through strong intention, thought, and yep. strong emotion linked to the thought. Every thought you have is electrical in nature it, right. in the brain. We know this in neurons. We can measure it. And every emotion, elevated emotion, you neural link to that thought creates a magnetic field, which can be measured. So you actually create an electromagnetic arc which acts like a Wi-Fi, which goes into the field of infinite possibilities and draws all the people, places, and circumstance to manifest. So I have two different thoughts. Number one, the thing that just popped into my head was, and I remember hearing this from stage and we've all in practice experienced it a million times, is you're cleaning out the old files. And as soon as you hear a name or you see a name and that vision pops in your head, you haven't heard from them in nine years and all of a sudden the phone rings. We've all experienced it. So I believe that maybe some people would call it the law of attraction or there's there's some sort of energy put forth and it comes back. Um, I, I, my question is, I believe that most people are just not aware enough to stop and utilize those synchronicities in their lives by creating those relationships on a deep enough level to ask themselves, why is this person in my life? Treat it like a casual encounter and therefore miss the opportunities. Is there a way for them to get more clear and get more aware so they don't miss the opportunities? Well, I think you hit it on the head. You, 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 we've all had the experience. Anyone who's been in practice for 10, 20, 30, or 40 or more years <laughs> knows that the best recall system is just going through index cards and invariably, we've all had this, before, before we send them out four, five, six patients, sometimes just walk in, never mind call. And then I always handed them the card. I said, I was going to send this to you, but I'm glad you got the message sooner than later. But there are, they, those are usually the patients I had positive relationships with. I had an emotional attachment in some way, or them to me. It wasn't just every patient that that happened to. It, there had to be some kind of emotional uh, connection with that particular name or a memory that came up when you read the name. So it, it, I don't think it would happen if you read, you, you know, your, your entire patient base. Uh, uh, gonna show a up. picture, right? It's a, it's a, it's a vision of some sort. It's a vision so, and a, it's a feeling too. It's but but, yeah. but uh, practice tip number one, if we could relate it back to practice and John Martini talked about this all the time is if you, every week, if you, assuming you have your staff meeting on Mondays, like everyone should, and you pulled out several of your inactive files of those people that you have, like you said, you have a relationship with, maybe they were you know, a, a good patient, so they just fell out of care. Maybe if you went over through a bunch of them each week and just said the name, why they were coming in, when they were the last time they were here and whatever pertinent, other pertinent information, and just reviewed that file for a minute or so, and you did a bunch of those each week, you'd be surprised that's an inactive recall, just doing that, utilizing synchronicity. And it doesn't cost you anything. And it doesn't cost you anything. <laughs> yeah. And let me tell you, it works as we do it. Oh yeah, it works. It works. So that so you can relate this to practice building 100%. For, so for those of you who are looking for those. And by the way, just you know, just from a a marketing standpoint, when you're starting with new patients, 
And we, we were always taught and we teach our members to look out for those influence keys in the community, those bird dogs. You know, like you said, you've seen hundreds of thousands of adjustments over your years and, uh, you know, just sort of let it fade away of, you know, I, I treated enough, we, you just stop seeing new ones after her, after X amount of years, just to be able to focus on these people that you had love in a relationship with. But when you start to see these patients as having a connection to, and to the bigger community that you're trying to serve, practices explode. You've had, I mean, we've all had one patient that's referred us 20, 30, 40, 50 new ones, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. you know, because we saw them on a different level. We connected on a different level. Absolutely true. Every word you said is 100% true, Rick. Yes, I, I would have to say ditto, ditto. <laughs> Listen to the Rick, he's, he's right on. <laughs> mm -hmm. So from your experience with practice for 45 years, and your understanding of all of these laws of the universe. Did you learn this stuff early on in career and then utilized it? Or do you find that you were sort of a startup chiropractor like the rest of we all started and then you just developed over time because of being in the time and space and experiences and learning? Well, I, I graduated as, a, as we were sharing before we went on online here with a lot of spizzerink, and BJ would call it. I really believe that chiropractic was the answer to all of man's problems. And that if every man, woman, and child wasn't adjusted, immediately planet Earth would spin out of orbit and the whole project would be aborted. So I came in with a great, uh, great mission. I was mission driven. I, I had the mission of changing the world. I used to, as I told you, I would wear these t-shirts, chiropractic today. You don't see this anymore for mm -hmm. a better world tomorrow. So I was mission driven, but I didn't have the tools I didn't have all the procedures that I needed. And, and interestingly enough, I got many of those from your dad, Rick, when I joined up with Marks and Management Program back after about eight years of practice. Now, I was successful, don't get me wrong, but I gave a lot of my services away for free at that time because money was never my issue. And I, and I was doing great, but I knew I needed to go to another level so I could write a check and give a charity some money. So I took MMS to learn the the, not the why. I knew the why of what, I, of what I was doing, but the how and the what. And that's what you guys provide for these young doctors, the what, the why, and the how. You have to have all three to be super successful. Just having the why is not enough. Just having the how is not enough. Just having the what is not enough. But all three together makes, makes for a trifecta. You know, it's like a restaurant. They got great food, great service, and great ambience. So you need all three. So what was your, your spiritual turning point when you went from you know, this, this great chiropractor to, I don't want to use the word spiritual healer, but let's say we went from chiropractor to healer. And there's a, there's a fine line. There is a difference there. What was the turning point for you where you kind of like said, you know what, I'm going to be thought through versus just thinking. And I'm just going to kind of, where I connect with the patient, it's all about a heart connection, the love resonating with them by vibrating at the same level and then letting go and it just kind of explodes from there. Well, for me, I was fortunate enough to have a great mentor. I've had several mentors, but the greatest mentor I have, I dedicate my book to. His name was Dr. William Bain. And he had the largest chiropractic, he didn't call it practice, service in the world. Mm. He saw over 3,000 patient visits a week. People would come by the busloads. Wow. And I went up and observed uh, Dr. Bill in practice. And I saw his love and concern for people way beyond their symptoms. Uh, uh, I, I guess you knew Ernie Landy too. Ernie Landy sure. was one of- Not the, far from, Ernie Landy was not far from me. It was mentored by Bill as well. And right. Ernie had the same attitude of total service. How can I help you? Not what's in it for me. What can I do to make you happy? By the way, Dick Versendahl had that too. Yeah. He was another mentor of mine awesome. uh, later on in life. Yeah. So, you know, I, I was blessed to, uh, to be mentored by some really fine examples of human beings. They weren't just chiropractors. They were just- beautiful souls you know I, I think about that too from a non-chiropractic standpoint you know especially these days if it all became more about service of what i what can i do for you you know i, I think this whole situation of, of where we find ourselves in the world is different 
yeah, I think if you come from the place of, you know, I'm here to serve, what can I do to help you? I don't think you're going to have any pr problem building the practice. I think the patients will get that innate to innate, innately, and they'll bring you others. They'll bring other people who, who want to share what you're giving. And they can smell it. A patient can smell where you're coming from. If you got the dollar signs in your eyeballs and you're thinking how much I'm going to make on this case, they're going to feel that too. So you got to be clear in your own heart. What can I do? And listen, I took care of a lot of pro bono in my lifetime too. But I came to a point where it had to be balanced. You know, I couldn't just give it away. I needed to be recompensed. And, and there's nothing wrong with having recompensation for the services rendered. And my attitude at the other end of my life career was you couldn't pay me enough. I mean, what I did for you was priceless. It's, but I did ask for money. I didn't, I didn't give it away. So, but service is the key. If you want to know the magic bullet to be successful in practice, come from a place of service. But what would you give advice to a chiropractor who, you know, we're coming out of this pandemic, you know, it seems to be getting better. I think practices are definitely starting to come around. People are breaking records right now. But what advice would you give to a practitioner, not necessarily a new one, but just someone who might be stuck in practice? They're trying everything, they're doing everything, and they're getting more aggravated, and they, they're, just, they're just stuck. They've plateaued. Coming from your point of view, what advice would you give to them? Well, I think everybody should learn some form of, med of meditation and listen to their own internal guidance system. There's no one size fits all. There's no one magic bullet that's going to turn people around. But if you're stuck and you're frustrated, you're coming from ego. You're yeah. coming from, from, from an egoic and not a spiritual consciousness. And sometimes people need to uh, take a vacation. <laughs> it's not, right. the, get out of the office, you know, right. do something else and spend, spend time in nature. Nature, I have found, uh, is very renewal. It's revivification. It, it revitalizes me personally, because when you connect with the natural world, there's so much energy or prana there that you'll come back and you'll feel refreshed. And, you know, you got to have, you got to have a full cup to, to, to pour some water in somebody else's cup. So you got to, you got to re revive yourself and physically you got to take care of yourself. You got to exercise, you got to meditate, you got to eat right. You know, unfortunately our profession, if you look around, there are many out of shape, out of terribly out of shape chiropractors mm. and you can't sell what you don't own and you better get adjusted regularly. I got adjusted once a week for, f I still do. Right. You're going to take, I, I mean, chiropractors, I said, when's the last time you got an adjustment? They said, oh, about six years ago. And I look at them and they say, what are you kidding me? How can I get, offer that to my patients? How can I ask them to come on maintenance or preventative care if I'm not doing it myself? So you can't sell what you don't earn, uh, own. So you better be doing the due diligence for yourself. Go, go back to the meditation for a moment. You know, one thing that I learned from Wayne Dyer, he said, he who sits in the middle knows. And I always got... <laughs> As you quiet the mind down, then you can start to hear what you need to learn and what you need to hear to kind of move forward. But from your point of view, talk a little bit about more about how important meditation is to one's life. I would say it's vital for, for your growth as a, as a human being, for your evolution. I don't think you can grow without finding some quiet time. Now, some people can't sit, so I tell them to do walking meditations hmm. because you'll get the information between the thoughts. They call it the gap. Right. That's that's when the soul speaks to the persona. Th there are two things going on in everybody, ego and soul. And there's a conversation and a battle going on all the time. The ego doesn't want to surrender control to the soul. So I always tell people, you know, you need your ego to navigate in this world. You're not going to be egoless if you're in a human body. But you better put your ego in the passenger seat and let your soul be in the driver's seat. Let the soul drive your vehicle. If the ego is driving the vehicle, you're going to have an accident. But if the ego's in the passenger seat, the soul can refer to it, say, where do I make the next turn here? So you need both. As long as you're in a, in a human body, you're going to have ego. So don't try to get rid of your ego. Learn to accept it, to love it, to embrace it, because it's like a child. It'll keep what? <laughs> It'll get your attention and keep you know pulling on you until you embrace it. I've done a lot of shadow work, the Jungian shadow work, which is vital, I think, to, uh, to embrace the parts of yourself that you that many people repress and suppress and project onto other people. They think it's all out there. The whole show is taking place in the back of your own eyeballs, really. Everything is holographic. We and are that, that's what Rick's father, Larry, always referred to as it's all in your mind, it's all in your head. And a lot of that's what he's referring to, right? I would say, I would say um, it's the mind through the body. You know, mm -hmm. there is there is a connection. The beautiful thing about chiropractic, the, the unique thing that we offer, you know, medical science is all matter, never mind. 
and uh, Christian science is all the mind, never the matter. And I say, no, it, chiropractic science is the expression of mind through matter. Mm -hmm. That's our unique gift and contribution to the healing arts. We are the connectors. We are connecting soul to persona or spirit to form or invisible to visible. And that was what BJ, that was his contribution. That, that was his unique contribution. And by the way, I don't know if a lot of chiropractors even know it, but the Palmer family were given this gift of chiropractic message through, through a channel. D.D. Palmer was channeled by the spirit world. He was a magnetic healer in 1895. He was a non-touched guy. He, he never touched the patient until he was told, hey, they can't relate. You've got to bring it down to the physical level. And he gave physical adjustments. <laughs> There's a little bit of history that people in chiropractic don't know about. But if you read it in the book, the 1910, the red book, it's there. You know, and, and the intent of chiropractic from the beginning was to bring about a unification between spiritual man and physical man. And there's no other healing art that does that. Right. So we can, we can be proud of that. We can be proud that we are, we are the connectors. We're bringing the invisible to the visible. Well, when we see the communication where docs have an opportunity to talk to patients or even from your personal world, you have the opportunity to connect with friends on a different level, family members on a different level, coworkers on a different level, but everyone, like you said, is so protective in these days of protecting ego or protecting self first. So service becomes second once they feel like they're okay or they're safe or they're comfortable. I, that's I, I, the, the book, the, pen, the Pendulum, the book Pendulum in terms of these times in society that sway back and forth. That's this sort of crisis of conscience we have right now. I agree. Everyone's so protective of self that that ability to now connect on this synchronous level is really limited, unfortunately. Well, there are only two really primary emotions, fear and love. Everything else is graded between the two. And if you're in fear, you're not, you're not expressing love. Love is the attractor. People will come to you on a love vibration. They're not going to come to you on a fear basis. You can control people with fear temporarily, which some people do. They say, well, if you don't do this, this and this is going to happen kind of a thing. You know, you hold a gun to their head, but I would suggest never scare a patient. Mm, you know, right. Never scare a patient. Right. You give them options, let them choose. You'll say, I have, I have relief care, I have corrective care, I have lifetime wellness care. Explain what it is to them and let them choose. It takes all the stress off of you. And rather than you trying to talk them into lifetime, I used to, I made the mistake in the beginning, everyone who came in, I wanted them to be coming for the rest of their life. I say, by the way, we're going to be getting care. You're going to have to come here the rest of your life. And they look at me like, hey, doc, I don't even know if you could help me. And now you want to tell me I have to come the rest of my life? No, no, you got you to do it. In, in, you got to spoon feed them. You know, let them see that you can help them. And, that, and, and, and we may not want to admit this, but most people come because they have a condition. Very few people in my 45 years came in and said, you know, I came here because I want to stay well. No, there, occasionally I got one or two like that, but most people came with a complaint. And we need, to, we need to address that at the level of their response, not to deny it. You know, I remember I gave a lecture once, this great lecture of the big vision of chiropractic, and a guy in the front row very sheepishly raises his hand. He says, hey, doc, that's a great lecture, but what, you, what can you do for my shoulder? I can't lift it. <laughs> and I said, oh my God. <laughs> I, I, then of course, yeah. And in the beginning, I would never touch the point of pain. You know, if they told me the shoulder hurt, I wouldn't even go there. No, no, no. Meet would, them where they I, are. I got smart. I said, oh, let me feel your shoulder. Let's do it. But I knew where the problem was. It was in his neck 99 times, but I didn't deny it. So we got to feed people at the level they can probably eat the food, you know. But, you know, you learn this over time, you know. <laughs> when that guy had raised his hand that day, I had a rude awakening. I said, oh, my God, I'm speaking up here, and they're, they're down here, and we're not connected. So I, I, had to, I had to tone down my message so they could understand it, they could digest it, they could metabolize what I was giving them. Otherwise, they were getting indigestion. Well, we have that same challenge when we speak to chiropractors who come out of school, they're not really educated on how to communicate. And they start going in with these, you know, 40 minute, <laughs> you know, dialogues about x-ray findings. It's, it's, that's not where our, our report of findings is. The report of findings is a conversation. It's not a lecture. 
if you're not turning one anyone into a radiologist in, in a 25 minute report of findings and that's not what they care about anyway so like you said it you know if you can meet someone where they are find the common ground between the two of you so th that's where i think synchronicity has these sort of two different ways one is people come to your life and how do you connect on a deeper level so it's not just a a haphazard meeting or a surface kind of connection. And then the ones where you're really starting to manifest the right people at the right place at the right time, because, you know, as Brett and I have taught a zillion people, do you have goals? Do you know your value systems? Do you know your vision? Do you know your personal purpose? So if you are really clear and you, you know, I know Brett and I, we, we know our personal purpose statement by heart. We have our vision, mission, and you know, and, and it's all crystal clear. And once you have that clarity, and now you learn the ability to manifest the people at the right time with the right skill set to be able to help you up your journey up the mountaintop, that's the when you're using synchronicity. Right. When your vision is clear, when you have clarity of, of mission, and you declare that to the universal consciousness. It conspires to send the right people, circumstances, timing, and events to you. You don't have to go out chasing them. It will all come to you. And I think that that's the experience that a lot of people learn over time. It's about manifestation. And when you said before how important, you know, quieting the mind and, and doing these, you know, whole thing about visualizing and just manifesting and just quieting down when you can see it, feel it, because as your vibration begins to increase with the right love energy and the right passion, the right service energy, your vibration increases, that's based on the law of attraction, then you attract people, places, and circumstances who are vibrating at the same frequency. So if love is the highest frequency, right, and you're constantly in that mindset and quieting the mind to allow that vibration to increase to that level, that's when you, the attraction is strongest. And that's when you start to attract the right people, the right people, because it can go the opposite. When you're in fear and anger, right? You're going to attract people that fit that vibration and people don't even understand that. So, so to me, that's also a part of the synchronicity, right? Because it's attracting those things in. But I think that if people really want to manifest at a higher level without do, 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 do all the time, but just rather sitting and being and getting to that love and healing vibration. That's why I think, you know, quieting the mind is, is so important to me. You can, you can do less and accomplish a lot more. Right. And that's what that, exactly that's what that means. I, I agree with everything you said. Love is the primal tone. Yeah. But that means one has to learn to love oneself. Yeah. And embrace all the light, the dark, the shadow, the good, the bad, and the ugly that we all carry. We all have that. And, and when you can, be in love with yourself. And I don't mean this narcissistically, but really let, let your soul embrace your persona totally as it is. That's attractive. People will smell you. They will find you. Uh, it's not so much doing, it's being. It, it, sounds, it's, it sounds paradoxical because we were taught right. all our lives, it's all about the doing. Go out there and you know, do, 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 do. And I'm not saying you don't have to do certain things, but it's more about the beingness. And so if you take the tuning forks, you know, the, the, uh, the analogy of the two tuning forks, you just bring the second one within a proximity of the first one vibrating at a higher level and up it comes. And that's really what the doctor has to be doing. He needs to be vibratory high to attract the people and elevate their, their frequency. Because it, it is all about frequency and tone. Chiropractic was, sounded, was founded on tone, which is right. sound. Sound is frequency. So uh, it's not so much what you say, you know, when they come in into, their, into that adjusting room, they're going to feel you out. They're going to they're gonna sense you intuitively. No matter what you're saying here, they're going to feel you. So you got to do the work. And that's, yeah. that's, they feel certainty. They feel what your intent is, like you said. They know if, they know if you know. They know if you're full of it. Yep. All of it. But I, just because of my last name, I have to be a wise guy for like two seconds. So... <laughs> <laughs> Let's say I'm the typical chiropractor, the typical cry of all the chiropractors out there. New is, patients. How do I <laughs> get like new patients, patients. <laughs> right? So let, uh, just give me your shot. I'm a new chiropractor. I'm begging for new patients. 
you have a concept of synchronicity in the world, which means I'm in the four walls of my office crying. There's all these people around me driving past me. How would I utilize that concept of synchronicity? Well, the number one thing one must do to have more synchronicity in their life, you have to engage strangers. Strangers are friends you haven't met yet. You have to go back into your community and introduce yourself to everyone you meet. And you know, the old walk, whip out card. Do not be shy about inviting people to meet you because you're gonna give them something they can get no place else. So have this attitude, it's a pleasure for them to meet me. And I'm not just saying this egocentrically because I don't know anyone else does what we do for people personally as chiropractors. So we have, we have to, uh, I'm not saying sit in your office and meditate 24 seven. No, <laughs> get out of your office, go eat, eat in, a, eat in a, a restaurant, introduce yourself, get to know the waitresses and the waiters. They know a lot of people. I went up and down in my town when I moved here, I didn't know anybody. I introduced myself to every storekeeper. I went in and I said, hi, I'm Dr. Ken Harris. I just moved to town. I'm a chiropractor. And if you, if you ever, I used to say, if you ever need my services, of course they needed them. But I say, if you ever need a good when, chiropractor, when come you see me. It. But I did lay lectures 25 years every Wednesday night without stop. I never missed a lay lecture for 25 years, whether one person came or 50 came. And I've had the experience where one person showed up and brought me 50 patients. Right. So never judge. You tell the story to the one the way you would tell it to the 500 because it's holographic. You're speaking to that one person, but in the subconscious, you're speaking to thousands of people connected to that one person. So get out of your offices, don't be shy, talk to strangers, ask them questions, listen to what they tell you. There's tremendous information you're gonna be given back because everyone has an energy and information exchange going on. And then you start to connect the dots. I mean, it's invariable, you're gonna start laughing because you're gonna meet people who know people that you know. It's crazy. Somebody then, by the way, that's where the B has to do yeah, you have to have both. We're not saying be only. We're not saying do only, which a lot of people do one or the other. It's putting it together and then ultimately creating exactly what you want. It's, you know, so it's a process. It takes time to do that. But you can increase the process by getting into action, but doing working on yourself first. Got to come first. Don't be shy. And, okay. and, and you, can't, you can't give what you don't own. Right. If you're not getting adjusted, guys, anyone listening to this, you need to be getting adjusted regularly. You know, I mean, again, how can you ask your patients to come on a maintenance or preventative wellness care basis if you're not doing it yourself? When I meet chiropractors and they tell me they haven't been adjusted in six years, I just shake my head. And then they want to know why they're struggling in practice. <laughs> By the way, you mentioned before, I was just curious, um, as we come to getting close to the end, you had mentioned a couple of your mentors, Wayne Dyer, Deepak Chopra. I know that you also taught Deepak Chopra's Seven Laws of Success. I sat in, I was part of that lecture when you gave that presentation. Um, I know you did that. So tell me, what's the greatest one or two lessons that you learned from Wayne Dyer? What's the top one or two lessons that you learned from Deepak Chopra? Either themselves personally or their work, I'm just curious. Let me think, because there were two different personalities. Right, right. I got to know Wayne very intimately. I mean, he and I, he and I were, were buddies. I mean, I took care of him, not just chiropractically, I took care of him energetically as well. And uh, I remember the first time he embraced me, he put his arm around me, and he looked down at me and he says, you know, Ken, you and I have one heart. I think I was spiritually connected to him in another lifetime, if you believe that. But I, I, I had such a resonance with him, much more so than Chopra. Chopra was a sweet man too, but Wayne definitely and, and I were connected in some other way at some other time in another lifetime, in my belief. And mm -hmm. his attitude was, he, he, he was mission driven. He wanted to wake up people. And that's my mission at this point in my life is to be a light, to shine the light on the path so people could see their next step. I'm not here to tell people what to do, but I'm here to inspire them and encourage them to, to learn, to go within and become self referred don't be listening to everybody else for advice. Start paying attention to your soul knows what you should or should not be doing. But you, as you said, Brett, you got to quiet the chatter. And the only way I know how to do that is through meditation. Mm -hmm. So if you're not meditating now, find, learn. There's many forms. I'm not promoting any particular form because, you know, Chopra had the primordial sound meditation, which I learned. But, you know, this mindfulness, uh, 
mindfulness-based stress reduction, John Kabat-Zinn's work. Very simple, just a simple breath meditation. You don't have to spend thousands of dollars on this. You can go buy a book for $5 called Wherever You Go, There You Are. That's John Kabat-Zinn's work. So um, Wayne was a meditator. Uh, he watched his diet. He was very conscious. He was an exerciser. So th they, they, they lived what they were promoting. You know, they, they definitely walked the walk. They weren't just doing the talk. And the same thing with Chopra and, and his humility. They both had, you know, even though they were world renowned and, and well known, I remember, I remember at a Chopra seminar, uh, I took all of his seminars and I taught the seven laws, but I'm at the urinal with the guy and he looks over, he says, Dr. Ken, he says, even divine beings, we have to pee. And I left, <laughs> he had a great sense. They both had great sense of humor. They both had great sense of, so keep, you know, have a good sense of humor because in the end, you know, I think, uh, Rick, you said that to me once at a year ago. I, 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 <laughs> that's not what I said. <laughs> anyway, so, so you know, uh, you, what was the question again? What was the one thing I learned from each one? I learned many things from both of them. And, and also I had other mentors. You know, Bill Bain, was, as I say, the primary one. And Dick Persendall was another one. And Pasquale Sarasoli. You, I don't know if you guys remember him. Yes. He yeah. lent me money to buy my house, the man. What a beautiful soul he was. And uh, you didn't need to get too many adjustments for him because he would articulate all 206 poems in 30 seconds. <laughs> Maybe you don't, I, I wouldn't go three times a week to him. Maybe once every, <laughs> every other year because you'd walk out, you talk about tone and vibration. I mean, you knew something special had just taken place when he adjusted you. And it's all about presence. You know, I, I, you know the thing about chiropractic, we fight over techniques. I don't care what technique you're using. They're all valid. They all get results. Every technique gets successes. Every technique has some failures. But own your technique. Whatever, as Rick would say, have certainty about what you're doing. And don't be looking left and right. And don't be looking for the magic bullet because there ain't none, guys. I would say if there is a magic anything, it's love. Treat the people as if you're treating yourself. When someone's on my table, you know what I'm thinking? I'm adjusting myself. I, would, I have the same intention and love for that person that I would do for my for myself because I think that's how it works holographically. You know, as you adjust them, you're really adjusting you. Pat used to say that. When you adjust the patient, you're getting the adjustment. So that's a whole other thing. I don't want to get off the topic, but it's, we can go into quantum entanglement. We can go into uh, quantum physics, but <laughs> metaphysics is, is now rapidly approaching and embracing metaphysics. And chiropractic is physical and metaphysical. That's, that's, what, that's what I want the people listening to understand. It's both. It's not either or. We are the connectors. And we're the only ones I know that can do that. Well, in our last minute, I guess the question we always ask is, if you had the ear of the profession, what would you want chiropractors to know or change or reconsider to be able to make the impact we know we can make? I would ask them to stop fighting with each other. That's what I would ask. There's so much division. There's so much rancor in our profession. There's so much ego in the various sub factions of our profession. And if we're going to unify the world and change the world, we better clean up our act as a, as a family. And, uh, you know, years ago, I, I have to admit, uh, I was so imbued with chiropractic. I was not always loving of other chiropractors and how they practiced. And I was judgmental and very critical. Well, as one matures, one begins to realize everyone is expressing their art through their form. And we're not here to judge how another doctor adjusts or whether he uses a, an ultrasound or a diathermy. Who cares? Is he there and with the intention of helping people? And I think the, the problem that we've never grown because we've had so much infighting within our own profession. I started the Sage Wisdom of the Chiropractic Council. We have 1,200 members now. And the intent of that was not to go into politics, but to go into the principles of what we do and why we do it. And, and now we have, you know, we're, we're getting a lot of great dialogue from every facet of our profession. And we're a clearinghouse, we're an umbrella now. We're welcoming everybody's point of view without judging. You know, you know, you got the schools that are all split up, even the vitalistic schools don't like each other. We're thinking of getting the presidents in a powwow and put them in a, in a uh, teepee with some Native American elders and do some real hot work. Because we're never gonna grow as a profession until we clean up our own house. We're a house divided. That, that, that's the sad part. Here I am 45 years later saying the same thing. Well, I, I want the listeners to understand that there's an opportunity which is to go deeper with your work. Um, we have our virtual seminar coming up for Cairo Destiny 
October 2nd and 3rd, and we are inviting guests to come for such a nominal fee for their entire staff, where you're gonna speak for two hours. We have other classes, we have CA breakout classes, with just a lot of the be, the do, in order to have the have, where you have to have some of the concepts of synchronicity to figure out what it is that you want, to get clarity on your vision, to get clarity on your purpose. Uh, I think that's a great opportunity. Uh, I know Kimberly's gonna put the link up. It's um, chirodestiny.com forward slash seminars. So you can learn more about Ken. We recommend that you get his book. We recommend that you start to quiet the mind. We recommend that you start to think about people as people and not about spines. About their, I, I love what you, these are souls that happen to have a spine, not the other way around. <laughs> We're in the people business. We're not in the. No, no, we are in the. We're in the soul shifting business. I love it. I like Ken, it. One more thing. Yeah, in please. terms of what we're all about and why we brought Ken on and why he's going to be speaking at our seminar next month, is because as a coaching program, Cairo Destiny Coaching Pro, we look at ourselves as, as a holistic approach. Again, almost like you look at a patient. Meet the patient where they are. We meet you where you are, and we do an evaluation as to why you're stuck. Where's your mind at? What's going on? But we also break down all, all of your procedures and systems and your financials and everything. So that's a part of what we do. But I think a part of also what we do that a lot of people don't do is we look at the headspace as part of it too. So we want you to become masters at procedures and systems, the philosophy, the marketing, all that is absolutely essential and important. And then what we do is we start digging deeper into the six inches between your ears and find out where you're really coming from. Where are the fears? What are the stuck points? Because that, as all the experience and all the chiropractors we've coached over the years, that's the difference between good and great. You were talking about gaps before. One of the things that we look to do is to bridge the gaps. Not like in London where they say mind the gap. We actually help you bridge the gap, like all those gaps going in. So I think if you look at it as a holistic approach to be, the do, the have, procedure, systems, marketing, philosophy, and then you couple that with what's going on in here, because that's the difference that makes the difference, right? We help you to get clear about what is your purpose? What is your vision? What is your mission? And when you're super clear about that and you become more confident and more certain as a human being, as a practitioner, then you can begin to create more of these synchronicities in your life. You can manifest the practice of your dreams much faster and help a lot more people doing it. And you're going to be a lot happier and it's more fun to build a bigger practice. And, and to me, that's what separates what we do from a lot of other people. And a lot of other people, they do great things. I'm just not taking away from them. I'm saying how we're different, but that's why we wanted to bring Dr. Ken Harris on tonight. We really, really appreciate you being here. And for those that kind of vibed with that or want to learn more about it, please come to our center that Rick mentioned before. It's going to be fantastic. It's part of what we're going to be teaching and going much deeper, how to create the 7654321 synchronicity. Mm -hmm. I said that correctly, mm -hmm. last off. Um, so we got a lot of cool stuff coming up. Um, so in virtual. So, uh, you know, again, this, Ken, this is the first time we've ever taught virtually. You know, we've been doing seminars for, you know, decades already. So we're looking forward to, even though it's going to be on the screen and we love to share physical space with you, we know that this is just a springboard to something better and newer once we can all start to travel again and be around each other's space. And, like you know, for us, it's always been, this is about manifesting your best version of yourself, manifesting your best life. This is about manifesting the right spouse or the right staff or the right money, or the right relationship with your children, or the right practice. The, the sky's the limit. And, and we know that the, the information that you've shared with us tonight and what you will be sharing a couple of weeks from now in our October 2nd and 3rd is just going to change lives. I hope so. We need to get our headspace and our heart space in alignment. Once they're in alignment, watch out. The sky is the limit. And you're going to have fun. You're going to, you're going to be happy. You're going to be looking forward to going to work. Not saying, oh, no, I got to go down in the office again. And, you know, this person's going to come in and ask me how to do this, that, and the other. No, no. It's going to change the whole tone of your, of your office. And your staff will feel it. Your staff will start to want to support your mission. But the work is internal. 
get clarity on your mission. And you need, as, as uh, Brett said, you need it all. Procedures, you need all three, the why, the what, and the how. They're all necessary, just like, just like to be healthy. Thank you again for staying up late with us, everybody, and Ken. <laughs> and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you every Tuesday night for uh, Tuesday Night Live with Cairo Destiny. Ken, you're, you're a treasure, you're a gift. You're awesome. And uh, we just can't wait to spend more time with you. We'll see you in a couple of weeks. You sure will. I you sure we, will. We we'll be right out of bushy tail. I know you will. We appreciate everybody. Have a great night. We'll see you next week. Thanks, everybody. Get some rest. Meditate tomorrow morning. <laughs>